Hi, so welcome to the video. Today we're going to take a look at how to do a paired t-test on SBSS, which is a test that we'll typically use when we have a within participants or within groups independent categorical variable and when we have a continuous dependent variable. So for this example, it's a little bit weird, but we're going to imagine that we've measured how far people can walk before and after drinking some tequila. So in this side of the Excel file, this is how far the people have walked, let's say in meters before tequila in a straight line. And on this side, it's how far they've walked in a straight line after drinking tequila. If you prefer to have a more conventional example, you can just imagine that this is something like before treatment and after treatment. And these could be the participants scores on some sort of measure of their symptom. So whatever you like, the principles are exactly the same. So the first thing we're gonna do is take a look at how to enter the data into SPSS. We'll also take a look at the assumption of this test. We'll take a look at obviously how to run the test and how to interpret it. Uh, we'll also take a look at how to create a graph and we'll take a look at how to present the results in APA style. So the first thing we're gonna do is set up the SPSS file. So to do that, I'm just gonna go here. Then I'm gonna go right to the bottom here and click this variable view button. And then I'm just gonna click this top cell in the name column. And I'm gonna enter the name of one of my conditions. So that's gonna be before in the case of this example. And then beneath that, I'm just gonna enter the name of the other condition. So after in this example. Next, I'm gonna use the measures column to specify that we're looking at a continuous dependent variable. So I'm selecting scale in the measure column for both of these rows. Once I've done that, I'm gonna to go to data view and I can see that before and after have appeared at the top of these two columns ready for this data to be entered. So I'm just gonna go back to my Excel file and copy the data from both of these columns and then I will paste it into these two columns in SPSS. So the assumption of the paired samples t-test is that the differences between the two conditions are normally distributed. So to do this, we have to go to transform, then compute variable, and then we're just gonna transfer before to this numeric expression bit. I'm gonna enter this minus symbol. So I'm just gonna click on that, and then we're gonna transfer after to the numeric expression box as well. So I've got before minus after. So one condition minus the other condition. Before clicking OK, we just need to give a name to this new variable that we're gonna create. So I'm gonna call it difference in this test, in this uh, target variable box. Then I'll go to OK. And so that creates this new variable in our SPSS file that represents the differences between the before and after conditions. So we've got 10 here, seven here, 10 minus seven equals three, nine minus eight equals one, etc. So we can now use this difference variable that we've created to check whether the differences between the conditions are normally distributed. So to do that, we can go to analyze, down to descriptive statistics, then over to explore. Then I'm just gonna transfer this new variable that we've created to the dependent list box. I'm gonna click on plots. I'm gonna untick stem and leaf because I don't think that's very useful at the moment. I'm gonna click histogram, but we won't really look at the histograms. You can use histograms to check normality, of course, but I think it's better to use the normality plots with tests because you get a more definitive answer with those. So I'm gonna click the normality plots with tests option, then I'll go to continue, then I'll go to okay. Okay, so I'm going to just scroll down a little bit. Um, so as you can see, it does, because we ticked histograms, we do get this histogram that represents the distribution of the different scores. And you can see this kind of a normal distribution. But as I said, I prefer to uh, refer to this test of normality test instead, because it gives you a more definitive answer. And specifically what we're gonna look at is this right side of the table where it says Shapiro Wilk. Sometimes researchers will look at this side of the table if they have a larger sample, but we only have 10 participants in our example. Um, normally you'd use this side if you have over 50, but since we only have 10, I'm gonna focus on this side of the table. And specifically what I'm looking for is whether this value here is above or below 0.05 and in the case that it is above 0.05 it indicates that the data are normally distributed 
So that's what we want to see. We want to see that we have a normal distribution with respect to the differences between our conditions. If you see that this value is significant, it indicates that the data are not normally distributed, in which case you might consider using a non-parametric equivalent of the PET sample t-test, such as a Wilcoxon signed ranked test. So to run the PET t-test itself, I'm going to use to analyze, then I'll go down to compare means, then across to paired samples t-test. Then I'm just going to transfer my before variable over here, and I'll do the same thing with the after variable. If you're using version 27 or later of SPSS, you will also see an option down here that will say something like the effect size estimate or something like that, which you might want to take. I'm using version 26 here, so that option isn't available, but as I'll show you later, there is an easy way of calculating Cohen's D based on the results that we'll generate during this step. So yeah, I've just transferred those two over, then I'm gonna to go to OK to run the test. So down here, we can see that we've got some descriptive statistics. So people walked a little bit further before tequila compared to after tequila. So 9.5 meters compared to 6.8 meters. And we can also look at the results of the paired samples t-test, of course. So what we want to pay the most attention to, or the most interesting thing usually, is the p-value in the sig column here. Because we have a value of less than 0.05, this indicates that there was a significant difference in how far people walked before and after drinking tequila. So let's take a look at how to report those results, as well as how to report the results of the assumption check that we performed. So here's an example of the results. So we can just start off by saying what sort of test we did and what we used it to test. So a paired samples t-test was conducted to compare distance in meters walked in a straight line before and after alcohol consumption. The next sentence refers to the Shapiro-Wilk normality test that we performed. So a Shapiro-Wilk test indicated that the differences between the conditions were normally distributed and that said W equals 96 brackets 10 P equals 0.825. So let's just take a little look at where those values come from. So we'll go back to that tests of normality table. So we've got this number here, 0.964, which I've rounded, I believe, to 2.96 in the example. So W equals 0.96. We have a degrees of freedom of 10. So that's this value in brackets here. And we have P equals 0.825 and that's just this value in the sig column here. So we've reported the outcome of the assumption check. Now let's report the results of the t-test itself. So participants walked significantly further before consumption compared to after. So here I've inserted some descriptive statistics. So mean equals 9.5, standard deviation equals 0.71, and that refers to before consumption. So if we go back to the SPSS output, we can see that in our paired sample statistics table, we have a mean of 9.5 for the before condition and a standard deviation of 0.71 rounded to two decimal places, which is what we see here. Compared to after, so same thing again, mean equals 6.8, standard deviation 2.78. We go back to the same table, we'll look at the after row, and we can see that those values are here, 6.8 and 2.78. So next we have the t-test results itself. So t equals 2.73. So where does that come from? So let's take a look at this paired samples test table. T equals 2.729. So I've just rounded that value there to 2.73. We've got this degrees of freedom value here, nine. That's what appears in brackets here. And finally, we've got a p-value of 0 0.023. And that's what we find in the significance column here. The last thing I'll show you is this effect size sentence. So the effect size was large, D equals 0.86. So that refers to Cohen's D. As I mentioned, later versions of SPSS from 27 onwards have an option where you can tick for Cohen's D when you're running the test. Uh, so if you have that version, you will see a table at some point in the output that says that provides you a value here. If you have an older version of SPSS, you can actually just use some of the statistics from this paired samples test table to calculate it yourself. Specifically, you're going to divide 2.7, so the value in this mean column, 
by the value in the standard deviation column, and that's going to generate a value of 0.86, which is typically considered a large effect size. I'll put a description of how to interpret different effect sizes in the description below the video. So finally, let's take a look at how to create a graph for these data. So to do this, I'm just going to go up to graphs and then over to chart builder. And I've got bar selected in this menu here, it's the default. And then I've got this simple option here. I'm mean, just gonna double click on that. You can either double click it or drag it up into this window. And you can see that this changes what appears up here. I'm gonna drag before into this X axis box, sorry, this Y axis box, and then after also into the Y axis box. This sort of creates summary group window appears, but we can just close that by going to OK. And if you'd like to have error bars, you can tick this box over here. So it's pretty common to have these 95% confidence interval bars. So I'm just gonna keep that option selected. So when all this window looks as it does, I'm gonna go to OK. And that's gonna create this big ugly graph for us. Uh, so this doesn't look very good as it is. So what I would do is just double click on it and that opens the charts editor. So some things you might like to do is get rid of certain things that you probably don't want. Probably you want to generate your own title within, for example, a word file. So I'm just going to right click on this bit up here and just delete it. Same thing for the the error bars thing, I'd probably just delete that and create my own note for that. Uh, you can click on the bars themselves. So if I double click on the bar, it opens this properties window and then you have some different options. So for example, at the moment, the bars look very wide. So I would go to this bar options tab and then just decrease the percentage of this option here to decrease the width of the bars. You can also go across to this fill and border tab where you can choose some different colors. Um, for example, if you're presenting this graph in APA style, you'd normally choose a color that's on the grayscale. So I'd probably just choose a color like this and then click apply. Finally, you can just um, click any elements within the graph and then you can choose you know a font that matches whichever font you're using in your reports okay so they've got times in your roman let's choose that one and that looks pretty looks quite small at the moment you want this to be nice and clear so i'll just choose a bigger bigger font size and obviously you can just do the same sort of thing for any elements within the graph and any changes you make here in the chart editor are saved automatically so i can just click this here this close button and I can see that these changes have been saved here. And finally, let's just take a quick look at how that graph would look in reports. Formatting this in APA style, I've just put a, a figure one in bold here, not in italics, no sort of punctuation after it. And then below that, I've got a sentence in italics that's not in bold and that uses title case. So title case is just when you capitalize the first letter of every word except things like prepositions and articles. So words like in and a and and, you don't use a capital letter for. And then I've just put a little note underneath explaining what those error bars refer to. So that's pretty much it. I hope that was helpful. If you have any questions or any doubts about anything, just let me know in a comment and I'll try to get back to you. Thanks a lot for watching. See you next time.